Let me tell you a story. A couple of years ago, I noticed something that really surprised me. Whenever I had a problem with a colleague or my husband or one of my kids, I never thought, I wonder what my mom would do in this situation, or my dad or my sister or even my best friend. What I actually thought was, I wonder what Jim Anderson, the dad in Father Knows Best, would do, or how would Jane Eyre handle this, or I admit when the kids got older, what would Darth Vader do? <laughs> but then I had a genuinely disturbing thought. See, it wasn't just TV and movies and novels that were affecting me. It was also commercials. I mean, sure, now we can fast forward right past them or blissfully binge watch all five seasons of Breaking Bad without ever having to pause for a single important commercial message. But back in the day, we had to sit all the way through them. And they were long, sometimes a whole entire minute, which always felt to me like such an incredible waste of time and money on the advertiser's part. I mean, I, for one, was way too sophisticated to be influenced by some cheesy ad extolling the virtues of a random brand of laundry detergent, especially since there was no chance I'd ever buy the brand in question given my tried and true method of picking cleaning products. I bought what my mom always used. Were they the best cleaning products? How the hell would I know? But they were familiar. They reminded me of home. They made me feel safe and secure. So I figured those ads had no influence over me. I was home free. Except I wasn't. It all came to a head late one night. My husband was away on a business trip. The kids were finally asleep. And I was jonesing for a little bit of adult conversation when, right on cue, there was an unexpected knock. And I heard my nice new neighbor call out my name. But instead of feeling happy, my heart started to pound because my house was a big, fat mess. I mean, sure, I bought the same cleaning products my mom did. Doesn't mean I actually used them. <laughs> anyway, the knock came again, but I was frozen, paralyzed by this imaginary montage of utterly spotless houses in which women, and yeah, it was always women, were happily washing their clothes in Tide or gleefully dusting with end dust or joyfully swabbing the decks with mop and blow. I looked around at my own dirty, dusty, disheveled apartment, and I felt ashamed. Clearly, there was only one thing to do, pretend I wasn't home. Yeah, see, somehow I had swallowed the bait and internalized the notion that if my house wasn't as pristine as those houses on TV, I was unworthy, too unworthy to even open the door. And here's the really scary part. If you had asked me at any point from high school on, I would have told you in no uncertain terms that I do not believe that cleaning is a woman's job or that anyone's self-worth should be defined by how recently he or she is dusted. This was something I believed to my core, except it seems when it came to how I actually lived my life. Point being, I can't begin to tell you how disconcerting it was to discover that what I thought I passionately believed was at complete odds with what I felt was true. To wit, if my house is a mess, you'll know I'm unworthy and I'll feel ashamed, so please call before you come over. And it gets worse. Because you know what finally saved me? Watching reruns of Roseanne. You ever see her show? <laughs> Her house was always this big, gigantic mess, and she could care less. In fact, she laughed in the face of anyone who judged her for it. And so once again, without thinking about it, my worldview shifted. Seeing the world through Roseanne's eyes changed how I saw my world. It changed how I saw myself. So having thus tracked down the origins of some of my most closely held beliefs, you can understand why, for a long time after that, I thought I was the shallowest person on the planet. I mean, whether I knew it or not, I was charting the deepest waters of my life based on advice from sitcoms and pop songs and movies and novels and cleaning product commercials. The world of entertainment was my guide, the world of make-believe, the world of stories. I felt really dumb. But then I remembered something that Rafiki said to Simba in The Lion King. <laughs> Yes, the past hurts, but you can either run from it or learn from it. And I decided to learn. So I started listening to other people's stories, and what I discovered was I wasn't the only one whose behavior, 
whose entire worldview was shaped by the stories I heard. In fact, do you know what's often cited as a major reason for the success of the civil rights movement in the 1960s? It was a novel. It was called To Kill a Mockingbird, and it profoundly shifted how white America viewed racism by allowing them to experience its inhuman injustice through the eyes of Scout, a six-year-old white girl. In fact, a 1991 survey by the Library of Congress Center for the Book found that To Kill a Mockingbird came in second only behind the Bible in books most often cited as making a difference. Oprah Winfrey called it our national novel. First Lady Laura Bush said, it changed how people think. How? By changing how they felt. Because you can't change how someone thinks about something without first changing how they feel about it. We're always talking about how to reach other people, how to connect. We long to feel understood and heard and like we're making a difference in the world. And what do we do to make that happen? We explain ourselves. We rely on facts, figures, data, logical arguments to, to get our ideas across. In fact, chances are everyone from your mom to your kindergarten teacher to your history professor has extolled this particular method of, of getting information across if you really want people to actually understand what you're saying. And as you may have noticed, it doesn't really work. I mean, just look at how polarized our country is at the moment. Now, whatever side you're on politically, I'm betting that at some point you thought, you know, if only I could get the other side to really understand what's actually going on here, we'd all be on the same page. So I'll just explain it to them one more time. Good luck with that, because that other person, you know what they're doing while you're explaining it to them? They're waiting for you to stop talking so they can tell, tell you why everything you just said was wrong and why what they believe is right. And when they're talking, you're doing the same thing to them. So you don't get anywhere that way. Turns out, the only way to get people to really understand you has very little to do with objectively outlining the facts and making detailed analytic arguments. The only way to convince anyone of anything is hardwired into the architecture of the brain, and there's no overriding it. It's story. It's Roseanne. It's To Kill a Mockingbird. It's cleaning product commercials. We think in story because story provides a context for the facts so we can make sense of them. It's this very subjective process that gives the meaning, triggering the emotion, the feeling that then silently guides our every action. The secret to getting your point across, to feeling heard and understood and loved and, yeah, let's admit it, powerful, is simply to understand that story rules your life and then learn how to tap into its unparalleled transformative power. Because make no mistake, story is a superpower that's been hiding in plain sight from time immemorial. There has never been a society on Earth that didn't have storytelling. It's a human universal, which should have clued us into the fact that there's a bit more to it than just a great way to spend a Saturday night. Why don't we know about story's superpower? Why does it come as a surprise that we're wired for story, that story is how we make sense of everything from birth until we shuffle off this mortal coil? Ironically, the answer is because we love story so much. Because it feels so incredibly good to get lost in a good story, we tend to think of stories as entertainment, fluff, and thus optional. It's like, yeah, sure, our lives would be far drabber without stories, but we'd have survived just fine. It's not like story serves any actual purpose or anything. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Story was more crucial to our evolution than our opposable thumbs. Because all opposable thumbs did was let us hang on. It was story that told us what to hang on to. Just think of story as the world's first virtual reality minus the geeky visor. Because without story, all we'd have is the perpetual right now. We wouldn't even know there was a tomorrow, let alone be able to speculate on the dangers and delights that might wait for us there. It was story that allowed us to step out of the present and so envision the future and plan for the thing that from then to now still scares us more than anything. And do you know what that is? The unknown the unexpected. Because ask yourselves, how often does what you expect to happen actually happen? And in those rare instances when it does, how often does it feel like what you thought it would? Hardly ever. Stories are simulations that allow us to vicariously experience difficult situations we haven't yet had to face to see, what would that really feel like? And what would I need to learn in order to survive? Like, 
I see those red berries over there, and they look delicious, and I am starving. And did I mention it's the Stone Age, so I can't go to the market, buy a frozen burrito, take it home and nuke it? But I heard this story about the Neanderthal next door who chowed down on a couple of handfuls of those berries and keeled over dead. So I guess I'll forego the berries and eat a couple of cold, stale bugs and live to see the dawn. In other words, the story was so crucial to our survival that nature, our biology, saw to it that it was enjoyable so we'd pay attention and not eat the red berries. Stories feel good for the same reason food tastes good because without it, we couldn't survive. And that great feeling you get when you're lost in a story, it's not arbitrary, it's not ephemeral, it's not pleasure for pleasure's sake, it isn't even the point. It's actually the biological lure. It's the hook that paralyzes us, making the real world go away so we can experience the world of this story. You know what it actually is, that feeling? It comes from, it is a surge of the neurotransmitter dopamine that's triggered by the intense curiosity that an effective story always instantly engenders. It's your brain's way of rewarding you and urging you to follow your curiosity to find out how the story ends because you just might learn something that you need to know. And the takeaway is, we don't turn to story to escape reality, we turn to story to navigate reality because story translates big ideas, dry facts, abstract concepts into very specific scenarios, allowing us to personally experience the consequences of those facts through the one biological system by which we make every decision we ever make, our emotion. Which, of course, completely flies in the face of what most of us have been taught about how we're wired to make decisions and certainly how we should make decisions. Here's how that story goes. When you want to make a decision, they tell us, first you marshal all the facts, all the figures, all the data, so you can analyze it dispassionately in the cold light of objective reason. And during this process, there's one thing they want you to be vigilant about, and that is keeping emotion at bay, because emotion is an irascible scamp, and it's going to try to tiptoe in and cloud your judgment so you make a bad, irrational, illogical, impetuous decision that you are bound to regret. And that's a great model, isn't it? It makes us feel so safe, so secure, so in control. How many times have you been told that it's your ability to think rationally that makes you the master of your own ship? It's a great model. It just isn't true. We don't make decisions based on our rational analysis of the situation. We make decisions based on how that rational analysis makes us feel. In fact, if you couldn't feel emotion, you couldn't make a single rational decision. Let me give you an example. There's an amazing neuroscientist. His name is Antonio Damasio, and he frequently writes about a patient he had, a man by the name of Elliot. And Elliot was a really successful guy. He had a great job. He had a great family but he also had a benign brain tumor. Now, it was successfully removed, but they had to take some of his prefrontal cortex in the process. And after that, his life began to fall apart. He was in the process of losing his job and his family. When he went to Damasio and said, can you help me? I'm not me anymore. What happened? So Damasio ran a battery of tests, and what he discovered is that Elliot had lost the ability to feel emotion. Now, keep in mind, he still tested in the 97th percentile in intelligence, and he could enumerate every possible solution to every problem you could pitch at him. He just couldn't pick one. He'd go into his office and think, should I do that thing my boss wants me to do, or should I alphabetize my file folders again this afternoon? I don't, how do you figure that out? At lunch, he'd go from restaurant to restaurant looking at menus, but he never went in because he didn't know what he felt like eating. Just think about that for a second. Imagine if in your life you never felt anything about anything ever. It's kind of terrifying, isn't it? Because as Harvard psychology professor Daniel Gilbert says, indeed, feelings don't just matter. Feelings are what mattering means. And the takeaway is emotion isn't the monkey wrench in the system. Emotion is the system, which brings us right back to story. Because the brain doesn't learn by thinking about things objectively. The brain learns by feeling things subjectively. And story is the language of experience, whether yours, someone else's, or that of a fictional character. We think in narrative. You are the protagonist in your own life, and you evaluate everything, whether physical, social, or conceptual, based on one thing 
How is this going to affect me personally, given my specific agenda? Which is why we have the biological ability to push the pause button and put reality on hold so we can get lost in a good story. And when I say get lost in a story, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean it literally. They've done functional MRI studies that show when you're lost in a good story, the same areas of your brain light up that would light up if you were doing what that main character is doing. You're not reading about Jane Eyre. You are Jane Eyre. But here's the thing. Story in and of itself is neutral. And there's nothing we can do to unhook the hardwired power it has over us. You are being affected by stories every minute of every day, whether you know it or not. And yeah, sometimes they take us in, in the right direction, like to kill a mockingbird. But they can take us just as far in the other direction. You can end up believing that having a pristine house is what makes you worthy. And then you can go out to McDonald's for a Big Mac, a supersized fries, and a 32-ounce Coke because you deserve a break today. Or a bit more chillingly, you can internalize the notion that greed is good and that the less fortunate are takers rather than makers and so deserve to starve. That's why understanding the secret power of story is so crucial. And it can give you a sword and a shield. So how can you use story to better navigate your own life? Here are three ways. First, Learn to sense when you're in the sway of a good story. Yeah, you are going to feel first. That, that surge of empowerment that an effective story always leaves you with, that doesn't make you a dupe. It makes you human. But afterwards, respond mindfully. Weigh what the story's taught you against what you believe to be true. Did it really speak your language? Or was it a Trojan horse smuggling in ideas and beliefs that if you saw coming at you head on, you would run from? Second. Take some time and learn to master the tools of storytelling. So the next time you want to connect with someone, whether to motivate them or talk them into or out of something, you won't begin by explaining it to them. Instead, you'll be able to put yourself in their shoes so you can tell them a story that lets them see the world from yours. And finally, never underestimate the power of story. It doesn't just change how we see some things some of the time. It's the only thing that changes how we see the world and therefore what we do in the world. All stories are a call to action. The power of story is yours. Use it wisely. Thank you.